a student entering the U.S. school system today in mathematics, studies show that only one in four graduate proficient, and they likely face a steep decline as the complexity of the subject increases. We call this the mid-school math cliff. Why students are going over the math cliff is probably the biggest story problem in all of education. What we know is that if we're going to fix it, we're gonna to have to do things differently. I'm Scott Laidlaw, and this is your Masterclass. My first year of teaching, the problem was completely apparent. Only 20% of my students were graduating the eighth grade proficient in mathematics, and they were totally unmotivated by the 710 page textbook that they had to work with. The idea that we had was to build semester long story based games where we would immerse students into a context such as building an old west town. Or another one where we immerse them into the spice trade of the 1600s. And another one where students could build their own empires in ancient Mesopotamia on this large board map. But my favorite story is of a student who didn't really like math, but he loved playing empires. And he'd come to school early that day and he was out on the playground and he slipped and he fell. And the administration had him call his parents uh, to meet him at the hospital. And he got on the phone with his arm sort of just hanging there with a fracture. He said, can you meet me there at 10 a.m. after math class? That's when we knew that we were on the right track to develop empires into a fully digital version with the support of the U.S. Department of Education. Ancient Mesopotamia. Your village is in crisis. Your father, the Provident, traveled into the desert with a trade caravan months ago and has not returned. As successor, you now must lead. It is up to you, young Provident, to guide your people to build an empire. But here's the part I can't figure out. How many workers will we need to get the job done by sunrise? Tell us, Provident, how wide should the ditch for the new field be? Please help us make a plan, Provident. How much square footage of housing is needed for our population? How many arrows will I need this season? The number one problem that you have when you start to build one of these technological innovations is that they often match the way that we've done things in the past. And the way that we've done things in the past is that we've got a large textbook, a lot of information that we want students to learn. But the only way for us to get them to learn that is to offer out some sort of a trick. Uh, you might even see it in one of those big three-dimensional math games where students are traveling through a tunnel and up pops an equation and they solve that equation and then the door will open. What this is teaching is that math is literally disconnected from what's actually occurring. And that happens throughout all of our curricula. The problem is when we keep giving that type of reward, which is some metaphorical type of carrot, the brain starts to build a singular neural pathway where essentially it expects to receive that carrot for doing that work. Do this, get that. And the ability to do complex math or transfer learning to a novel situation is almost entirely impaired. By the time students reach middle school and the concepts are a little bit more complex, those strategies begin to fail, which is why we start to see that math cliff. If we want our students to be able to succeed in those upper level mathematics, we've got to give them a different approach, a different type of strategy. You guys can go ahead and log in and play the game and make sure you're helping those that ask for help if you can help them and give them assistance. This has to equal that. <laughs> how can you can't just divide it. 
That, that's what I was trying to do. Cool, look. The question is this. The problems that students encounter in a game like Empires are likely to be far more complex than they would be in their normal curricula. They intertwine multiple standards, they're multi-step, and they might take a full class period or even two full class periods to be able to complete. So what is it that makes them persevere and stick with it when normally they would not? The wheels for the riding carts of our people have always been made of ironwood like this. And they always measure two knuckle bones thick and 12 knuckle bones across. This design honors the sun and the moon as they ride across the sky. Provident, the 12 ironwood timbers are that large at the base. We can make some of these wheels Hotep speaks of, but the timbers quickly taper to a smaller diameter. We will only be able to construct a few of these wonderful new riding carts of yours. I wonder. So? Huh? Look! Nice try, my child, but not quite. Hotep's riding carts only need two wheels, and both need to be much larger. So, this is a design for a different kind of cart. This isn't a cart for riding, it's for carrying loads of bricks. Yeah. We can train our animals to pull the carts. Our workers will be able to move fast through the village, carrying heavy loads quickly. A good idea. Yes, but training the animals will take time and take them away from other work. Provident, I would advise you to build some of both kinds of carts. We'll need to measure this ironwood carefully and determine just how many animals we'll need to train. Provident, your assistance, please. How many total carts can we build? In an online class, we were using the game Empires to try to determine what it is that gets students to stick with it or persevere longer than they might normally in other situations. And there were three things that we found that really impacted the likelihood of students doing that. And the first one is, is that the students have to have a purpose or a reason for them to solve the problem. But the second is teacher messaging. We don't value fast work. Uh, fast work is sometimes quick work. We're trying to get through something. We don't value that. We value that you all have the time to think about what it is that you're doing. And it's totally okay to be stuck. It's totally okay to feel like you don't quite know what to do. It's totally okay to go slow. The students are used to those quick rewards. So you have to have a teacher message that lets them know that it's okay to change the pace. So I'm looking at this and I kind of guess sometimes, but one of the hints, it said uh, there are 12 logs, 12 timbers or whatever. And you're making wheels out of 12 inches and eight inches, right? What is that unit of measure? Is it an inch? It's knuckle bones. What do you think a knuckle bone is? Uh, an inch. Because if those feet or anything, it'd be very big. We could use the 14 inch wheels to make 12 inch wheels and the 10 inch wheels to make eight inch wheels. Would that be six times 12? Cool. And now we've got these ones. We got meaty carts. Okay. They're half a knuckle, knuckle bone, and they're eight knuckle bones. Uh, what? No, tall. I don't know. Three hundred and eighty-four. Or there's ninety-six wheels. Okay. There's four wheels per cart. As you listen to the student thinking through the problem, you'll notice that they have to backtrack. That they've got to revise their thinking. They've got to constantly track what unit they might be talking about. Is it knuckle bones? Is it inches? But as time elapses, they begin to make sense of it. There's 48 uh, wheels here between this, between 12 and 10, and 10 and 8. Yeah. You get 24 wheels from one of these. So it's a lot of these. Because you got a 288 plus 72. So that's how much hotep carts there. Okay. And you get 360. 
You want to try that and see what happens? I did it. And once they get it, that's the reward. The reward is, is that they comprehend the mathematics and they have carts for their village. The math and the story are seamlessly connected, building a synapse in the brain. And the funny thing is, once they're done with it, the grapple doesn't seem all that hard. My brain was hurting just for a little bit, and then it started coming together. How long did it take you to do that one math problem, Jackson? Do you know? Uh, since we started today, it was about 10 minutes, probably. When you get your students working through problems like this, that's the kind of practice that's going to help prevent them from falling off of that math cliff. But we mentioned that there are three things that you have to do. And so our work as teachers is not yet done. There is one more thing that you have to do to help your students succeed. Now comes the hard part. We have to carve the head of the winged bull so it fits perfectly into that notch. Um, wouldn't that have been easier to do while the crossbeam was still on the ground? What's done is done. But we can't just guess at it and then lift it up to see if it fits. That headstone probably weighs as much as eight camels. That's why I said now comes the hard part. If you could do an MRI imaging study of every student across the United States to see and detect what part of their brain is being used and what emotion it is or reaction they have to mathematics, sure, you'd find some differences. Some would be happy, some would be sad, uh, some might be excited about it, but the single number one thing that you would find in that brain is fear. The thing about fear that is interesting is that it doesn't matter if it comes from an imaginary monster from childhood, a live reptile from today, or math tests. It does the same thing to the brain. It shuts down normal thinking so that the activity occurs in the center of the brain, the amygdala, known as the fight or flight response. It might help from running from those monsters or reptiles, but it is particularly destructive when it comes to math. Mathematical thinking is dispersed throughout the brain, and all it takes is that extra little bit of pressure and fear to shut it all down. I wasn't able to do anything. I logged in. Okay. So each time I tried to do the problem, I had a panic attack. Did you try the same problem over and over, or did you look at different ones? Different ones. And same thing, too much. Okay. To break through these moments, of fear or panic, we need a really powerful antidote. And most teachers go at this by giving students what we might call a pre-perfected set of information so that students can inch along towards a solution. A challenge for us is that then the next time a student is trying to solve a problem, they're gonna look for that information or they're gonna look for their teacher. And if it's not there, they're gonna go right back into that panic mode. A much more powerful way of Handling this is to allow students to see each other's work with all the mistakes included. My thinking wasn't too different from everybody else's. For the teacher, that causes a little bit of fear because they think, oh no, they're, they're learning the wrong procedure or they're learning the wrong method. But for a student, it is life-giving because if another student can make a mistake, so can I. And that's what unlocks us from the fear in the panic mode. All I did was, well, I brought the two tools into a different tab and the picture of the wing of bull gate to a different tab so I could line it all together. And I made the tool as straight as possible 
and I tried to line it up with the edges of where it's gonna where the winged bull is gonna be. So the it could possibly help me find the angle that it's tilted at. Do you have but any it's strategies getting... that you use? Don't just handle it alone. Try and find outside sources to help you. It could be a family member. It could be like a few hints online. It could be friends. Don't go at it alone. <laughs> So we now have that foundation, the rich narrative question that the students want to solve. Uh, students are, are willing now to work through the problems more slowly because they're not expecting that immediate carrot. And they're able to see each other's work and see each other's mistakes and feel comfortable making those mistakes themselves, failing safely. That's the foundation that we need to get to the point where those synapses in the brain are really firing. But here's the trick. The outcome is part of what creates meaning and understanding of those concepts. So a student who learns math and applies it to building a model rocket will actually understand all of the concepts because the concepts come together and make sense in the outcome of the rocket launching. And for us as teachers, that's what we would call the aha moment. Wow. Wow. That is cool. It is cool. And it's also what's needed. For two and a half decades, we've seen students go over the math cliff. And the promise of educational technology is not for us to just take the old way of doing things and put it onto a computer, but to rethink completely the way that we design our curriculum so that we can create meaning and purpose in math, to be able to develop tools that match the way that we think and learn. You solve kind of problems that would happen in the real world, like finding the area of different homes or building granaries. Since the first weeks before I started using empires, it's been really hard for me to do math. And now that I started using empires, it's really getting better to me. I'm starting doing math better. It's different because if you just open a textbook, some people will get bored, but if you're interacting with what you're doing, then people are more likely to learn and pay attention. The process of letting go, setting the stage, and getting out of the way of the kids to do the learning is, is essential. And it makes it so that every kid that I have taught through using what I have learned from mid-school math makes them say math class is their favorite class. That's a win. <laughs> That's a win. I'm Scott Laidlaw, and this has been your Masterclass.